Let's say good morning to our co-hosts on this uh, beautiful, uh, frigid Thursday morning. Johnny the Bond, John Bondwell, JB. Good morning, Rob. It's a beautiful morning, actually. Hey, I got a question. Next time you have somebody or talk to somebody with the health department, I wonder what percentage of homes that use the radon detector actually detect radon. I've always wondered that. Fair question. Yeah. It can vary in rooms of your house and times of the year. It can vary. That's what I've heard. It's pretty scary stuff. Can't see it. Can't taste it. Can't smell it. But if you have a, a Picacurious reading of four, according to Bill Kearns, it's the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, even if you're not a smoker. Wow. So get your free rate on test kits. Very, di- very different than success, because you can definitely taste success. You can. You, know? you yes. can taste it. Some, on some people, you can see it. Yes. yes. Uh, let's say good morning to our other co-host, who's doubling as a guest as well in this first hour, Delegate Mike Height. Good morning, Robert. Mr. Height. It's great to be here. So uh, a couple of things. Um, I want to ask you about the tour of the ERJ yesterday. I know you and some other delegates went on a, a, a bit of a field trip to the Eastern Regional Jail. What was the purpose of the trip, and, and what was your observations? Well, the purpose of the trip was uh, fact-finding, obviously. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about um, the uh, correctional officers uh, being uh, not staffed appropriately, Um that the National Guard is in there and, and working uh, to help them out to make sure they have enough uh, correctional officers in there. So it was fact-finding. Um, and what we did find is, you know, that there's there's a huge turnover there. Um, they're understaffed by about half. They have, um, they have slots for 120 officers at the ERJ. Um, they currently have about 60 of those slots filled. Um, and then they have, I think, uh, about 40 um, from the uh, the guard in there. Um, but what they told us with the guard is, I mean, they're very helpful, but there's only certain locations that the, the, the guard individuals can work. So um, they have stations all around uh, both buildings, um, posts, if you will, um, and only certain ones of them that does the guard work. Um, they don't. They don't work in any location, I don't believe, that interact with the, the inmates themselves, that they, they reserve all those uh, areas just for the, the correctional officers that have been trained and, and know how to do that. So um, while the guard helps, it's, it's not ideal. So something needs to happen. Um, we need to get to a point where all of our, um, our jails and prisons are, are staffed appropriately. What were your observations of morale, if any, that you can observe in a short, brief burst of time that you're there? Well, as far as morale, I would say our, our interaction with with uh, with them was through the supervisors. So you had the, the, the top two, the lead people um, at the ERJ were the ones that were giving the tour and talking to us about a lot of the different issues. So you really couldn't have a lot of interaction with the other officers. So it was hard to tell what morale was until the tour was over and we were leaving and we stood outside and, and the delegates talked amongst themselves a little bit. And there were, there were several um, that came outside, uh, made a point to come outside and thank us for being there, that um, you can tell that, that they need help and, and they feel like they need help. And, and just the fact that we showed up and, and took an interest in the fact that they need help um, meant a lot to them. So um, there is a morale issue, and uh, you could tell by, by their actions. Who set this tour up? Uh, what delegates attended, Mike? Um, I set it up uh, be, just because there is a, a correctional officer uh, crisis. Is the ERJ in your delegate district? Um, no, it's not. I believe it is in Delegate Hardy's district. Okay. Um, but I, I felt like it was important. I knew that, um, or I had a good I- idea that we would be talking about this uh, in interims or in a special session um, before our next regular session. So I felt like it was important to get to know um, the issue um, to you know research it a little bit and, and maybe this was the best way to go in there and actually talk to the people that are being affected and find out what the issues are um, what are the the hiring restraints um, so uh, I reached out to um, to Eddie Gokenauer here the county council um, and asked him if he could facilitate um, talking to somebody over there and and um, 
you know, coordinate that. I think I was still down in Charleston when, when I decided to do this. And, and he was very um, helpful and, and, and called over there and, and talked to a couple of different people. Um, but early on, their response was, you know, we're not allowed to give tours. Um, so at that point, I contacted Daryl Coles with the, um, the governor's office. And Daryl uh, told my concerns, I guess, <clears throat> upchained uh, maybe to uh, Secretary Sandy, whomever. And within a day or two, they were calling us back and saying, yeah, they could arrange the tour. Um, as far as who attended, uh, you had County Councilman Eddie Gokenauer, you had um, Delegate John Hardy, Delegate Mike Height, or and Mike Height, Mike Hornby, mm -hmm. um, Delegates uh, Don Forst, Larry Kump, um, I think there was one other. Trying to think who else. It's it okay. Ah, we got yeah. the gist oh, of it. Oh, um, did Paul Espinosa go? Uh, uh, Paul Espinosa did come, yeah. um, and, and Chuck Hurst. Okay, very good. I John? That was obvious. Well, I mean, it's it's a very big problem in every um, every aspect of our state. It's our state employees are underpaid, especially in the Eastern Panhandle. I mean, as a small business owner, as you are also, Mike, I mean, if we're, if we're losing employees in droves, we have the ability to take a look and say, okay, we're going to tighten our – tighten our belts a little bit and we're going to pay people more so we don't lose them unfortunately with the state i mean there's there's a lot of red tape that has to be gone through and a lot of money that has to be allocated reallocated but when you're at 50 percent capacity that's scary i mean that that's that's a crisis a beyond a crisis i mean sure. we have a crisis in our schools with teachers leaving we have a crisis is there any state employ is there any state office that has employees that actually is staffed correctly at this point is everybody i mean is everybody just leaving because our state doesn't pay people enough you know i sat in in um finance committee meetings and as people came in and, and gave their um presentations uh that seemed to be a, a theme throughout the state and the state positions that there were staffing issues um in almost every department uh, I can't think of one offhand where th there weren't some vacancies. Um, and, and this one's no different other than the fact that it, it seems to be more so. You, you mentioned 50%. I don't know that any of the other ones were down 50% of what their allocation was. So th that's what causes this one to be a crisis. And the fact that you have to, to bring in your National Guard to help backfill positions, uh, that's that's certainly what should be a, a short-term answer um, to the overall fix. So um, something has to happen. I think the governor recognizes that. That's why I believe that there's going to be some kind of uh, some kind of solution that's going to be tried to be sought uh, during uh, the off season, if you will, maybe through interims or a special session. I mean, I know we don't want to we don't want to raise salaries too much because right now we do have this big budget surplus. But who knows what the state's going to look like in five years? And then if we promised a bunch more out in salaries, and all of a sudden our revenue goes down, we could be in trouble like a lot of other states. And that that's not how we run our state. Has there been any talk about maybe scaling back on the pensions that people are getting to more front load instead of all the money that has to go to cover the pensions, which are very important? but maybe take some of that money and give it to people up front, more higher salaries, less pensions, because state employees also, in addition to their pensions, they're all also going to get Social Security and stuff like that. Is it? Has there been talk of front-filling the money? No, I don't, I don't think there's been any talk about that. And, and, and you're right in some aspects. You, know, you don't want to base build, if you will. You don't want to raise um, what, the, what the state has to pay out um, to a degree. Um, we are seeing record surpluses, so if you don't do some base building now, when are you going to do it? We, we've, we've given tax breaks. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of things that uh, have, have taken some of that money, but there's still a lot of surplus left. So you have to start base building in certain areas, especially where there's crisis like this. You, you can't run a flatline budget forever, so there has to be some raises somewhere. Um, and is it money that's going to uh, correct this? I, I don't. Well, I don't I, think, I think money. I don't think money would hurt. Well, and I think that's where you start. I think you have to start. You have to 
and it's just like everything else around the panhandle when you when you look at what you know what they're paying in washington county or frederick county or even loudon and, and fairfax um for the same job um you have to say that that's a lot of times that's where your correctional officers are going they're going over there and they're making more money it's no different than the teacher situation we have around here so you know ultimately the the answer is locality pay but it's going to be that's going to be a tough sell at the legislature so you have to and and there's correctional officer issues other where other places around the state so it's not just an eastern panhandle issue um so I believe correctional officers uh, need a pay raise statewide, just like we did with the state police uh, a few years ago. So, um, or I think it was last year. So, it was last year. I, I think we need to get that done. Um, we need to get we need to get in there and figure out what it's going to take to um, start filling some of these positions to entice people to come to these these positions and and to start looking at what are the other reasons because it's not always about money it is about morale so but is is the morale down because they're working so much overtime and the slots aren't filled if if they had full staff would would that increase morale and i think it would to a degree but you still have to get in there and find out what are the, some of the other things um that that would help well Oh, and sorry, Mike. And, but I mean, the way we're, I mean, I assume the correctional department then has to pay out for the National Guard. They have to pay. No, their, actually, or, according to Mike Delegate Hornby, 82% of that is paid by the feds. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, nice. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's. The state only pays 18% of that. I mean, the, 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 the issues that I see with correctional officers are we train a lot of correctional officers. We're a farm system, very mm -hmm. similar to the Baltimore Orioles. Mm -hmm. we're, we're training all these people. The state is spending all these people. Then we keep them two, three, four years, and then they're going oh, somewhere not else. That. Not well, even that. Or a year. They're going, but they're already, they're fully trained. We've spent the money training yes. them. So to try to retain these people and all the overtime that we're putting out, I mean, when you're paying somebody time and a half, you know, it'd be better to have a lot more people at a higher rate. I, and here's the other thing. I mean, the, you say that the, the feds are paying um, National Guard, 82%. And that's true. They are. To, but we've already budgeted these positions. So it's not like the, the money's not there for the correctional uh, facilities to pay these positions. It's just not at a high enough number. So whatever we're paying the National Guard has already been budgeted um, and and there's still extra there because we're just not paying. The positions aren't full. Uh, right now, we, we're probably paying a large portion of it out in, in overtime that we wouldn't have if, if the positions were full. Well, with what these folks make, they may need the overtime just to make ends meet. Uh, well, that's true as well. Yeah. I mean, these individuals aren't making. I mean, they. I'm thinking probably somewhere in the range of sixteen dollars an hour is where they start. Well, and that when, was with the raise. Yeah, and and when you can go to P and G, and and make more money yeah, than you that, go to, you can go to Sheets, Sheets for seventeen dollars right. an hour. They and it's a lot safer. The training, the oh, tra safer. and a lot more fun. I'm sure. Hey, I mean, what is the turnover like? You mentioned there was a lot of turnover at the ERJ. Um, Did they mention it? They, they they just said there was. They didn't say how much, um, but I imagine it's pretty high. They, I mean, they mentioned a couple of times. You know, you get people in and they last. You know, maybe six months, a year, or whatever, and, and then it's a tough job. Yeah, you know, it, it's not it's not an easy way to make a living, uh, neither financially, you know, nor spiritually. It's a difficult place to be. Uh, it, you mentioned that of the hundred and twenty positions, sixty were not filled. Are those 60 all guard positions or are some of those uh, maintenance service staff, custodial, uh, cafeteria, that sort of thing? Yeah, it it's um I think they're all guard positions. Okay. And there are other positions um that are unfilled as well. I mean, they have they have positions allocated for counselors that aren't aren't filled a uh, position for a chaplain that's not filled um, so there's several positions that they have in there that haven't been filled for you know years so they have a, a position for they call it like an office manager so like a CFO um, that does all the, the financials and procurement and they said that position hasn't been filled in two years so you know who's doing that and are they keeping track of things the way it should be done um, is is it possible that some of these jobs no matter the economic environment, just will never 
be filled because one, you've got a limited number of candidates who wish to work in that environment. Two, the pay's not great. If you're if you're starting in in the high twenties or low thirties, even if you get a twenty percent bump, you're still not making enough money to pay rent in the Eastern Panhandle. Sure. So, again, considering the work environment, it's likely that they're not going to get filled. Is there a way, automation wise, to solve some of these problems, Mike? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about their systems to know whether th- that's an answer or not. Um, you would have to delve a whole lot more into what it takes to run a, a prison. It's just something I can't answer. Um, I would think that the the best way, I mean, the only way that those positions really are going to get filled is if we get into an economy where we have a very high unemployment rate. I mean, because those are the, the positions that, I mean, it is, it's a thankless job. It's a very difficult, very thankless job, and it, it's not just happening here. Um, I was at the home show this past weekend, and we wandered around, and Frederick County, Winchester, they had a uh, they had a table recruiting correctional officers, um, and I talked to one of the guys there, and he said they are way down um, as and, far as correctional yeah. officer positions. This is not and just, they pay better than here, and they sure. pay oh, they pay a good yeah. amount better than here to start. I want to say it was in the forties, starting close to fifty, but they're having the same issue we are. I mean. When I mean, if you if you can get a job working at Sheets for seventeen dollars an hour, where like you said before, Rob, you don't have the danger, and you know you have what three hours of training probably at the most. You're not having to go through a long training, and you're in there. You're making money versus making the same money in you know a place that is very depressed, that is not a fun place to be. I mean, it, it's hard to compete when the public when the public sector. Uh, salaries are so much lower than the private sector, and there are not a lot, and there are tons of open jobs. There are more jobs than there are people. Yeah. That's not an attractive job, unfortunately. Delegate Mike Height yesterday, along with several other delegates out of the Eastern Panhandle delegation, on a tour of the Eastern Regional Jail, where uh, they were reporting they were down about 50 percent, uh, 120 needed on the staff, 60 is what they have right now that they're making do with that. Is As a result of that, Mike, is the public in danger? Are the uh, inmates in greater danger than they should be? Are the uh, corrections officers in greater danger than they should be? I would say that the corrections officers are probably in greater danger um, than they normally would be. Um, you know, I, I think they have somewhere in the range of 450 to 500 inmates. Um, and This is not a maximum security prison. No. Um, but any time you have 450 to 500 inmates and you have 20 guards on staff around two buildings at any given time, you're you're outnumbered uh, mm-hmm. by a great a great deal. So the interactions with the inmates uh, they have to be really careful how how they interact with them and and in what what numbers and groups now the design of the the facility i'll tell you is is pretty ingenious that they're in um, pods they're separated out and there's doors between them so you know the the interaction with inmates could be as minimal if you're just dealing with one pod could be minimal down to you know like 10 to 15 inmates at any one given time so that's how you keep your your numbers as safe as you can but you may have one or two guards walking into a pod well if one or two guards walk into a pod and close the door behind them you know you're still 10 15 against two Mm -hmm. so um you have to be really careful and and you know they have to be on watch all the time to make sure that their safety is is, is because they're inmates they're Mm-hmm. They're there for a reason. Yeah, they're there well, for a reason. So. And what you said before about it not being a maximum security type of place, everybody who commits a crime, be it you know murder, anything else, in the Eastern Panhandle before they go to court, they're going to the they're going to the Eastern Regional Jail. So I mean, it's not sure. like it's a it's a country club with just you know you know shoplifters. Um, how long how long has the ERJ been there and what sort of I mean what is the facility like does it need upgrading is it does it look I mean does it look like it's it's been taken care of well um the, uh, the facility was <clears throat> was very clean um, I was really impressed by the way the facility looked um, 
So in in that regard, I would say it, it's as good as you're going to find anywhere. How old is the facility? I think the, the newer facility that sits in the back is maybe 20 years old at this point, 25. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was state-of-the-art when it was built. But just like anything else, it's, you know, there's some antiquated parts to it now. So um, they they talk a little bit about, you know, the locks and mechanisms and stuff being worn and needing to be, you know, I know we um, – we just allocated like twenty million dollars to upgrade the locks in uh in different facilities around the state now I don't know if it's in the e r j s or just the maximum facility uh prisons but I think it was it was on all of them so um I know there should be some upgrades there um, I would say they're they're pretty safe for the public uh we asked about that had there any been uh, any escapes from there and um, they said no no in the history of the ERJ there's never been an escape so um, in that regard I felt pretty safe well what um, <clears throat> we've talked about the jail a lot what other uh, what other things are you working on at this point to uh, to help us here in the eastern panhandle well before we get further into that because we're gonna we're gonna get into our halfway past eight well, o'clock break here before we get off the eastern regional we've got him all hour yeah, well, he's here oh, all morning. I, didn't, I, didn't, well, he's I not, knew he was here all morning, yeah, but I didn't. He's not leaving. He, the whole no. first hour is Mike Height territory. Mike Height. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to, if I get to spend the whole morning with Mike Height, I'm, I'm going to do this for free. I am giving up my zero salary today. Put another zero on the back end. Put another zero on the back end. Thank you, Rob. There was uh, a note in our comment community about uh, the option of privatizing the prison system. Mike, have you uh, given any consideration to that? Uh, there are pros and cons to that, obviously. Um, I, I don't know that anybody's given any consideration to that. Um, I, I haven't been in any major discussions about that. So, you know, and a lot of times I'm in favor of uh, privatizing uh, certain things that uh, I think private entities tend to run things more efficiently than government does. Uh, governments, uh, they're, usually their attitude is just throw more money at it. Um, rather than try to find places to save or, or find better efficiency. So um, I don't know. It would be something, something we'd have to take a look at and, and see, you know, talk to some of the uh, companies that would come in and, and do that. Ultimately, and that, I, I'm sorry, John, but ultimately after your tour yesterday, uh, did you come to a conclusion or an action item uh, among the delegation that went yesterday? Um, no, I don't think there were any conclusions. Just, uh, like I said, it was fact-finding, information gathering, that type of things. You know, so now um, we need to go back and discuss it. Uh, one thing uh, Delegate Hornby said, that he was going to contact some of the other delegates around the state and recommend that they set up and do the same thing that we did here in their area um, so that, that they can – Get, get a little taste of, of what we got a taste of and, and talk to the actual individuals before we get down to Charleston and, and do start discussing this mm -hmm. in earnest. Good, John. Well, about the privatization, I mean, one of the, from what I understand, one of the best things about it is it becomes, prisons become more of a fixed cost then. Mm -hmm. You're not, and you also don't have the, you don't for have the, the state, you mean? For the, for the state, yeah, it becomes more sure. of a fixed cost. And you also don't have the back ended costs. You don't have the, the pension costs and stuff like that, which are always a consideration. I mean, that used to be how, how basically state employees were sold on the job. Yeah, we're going to pay you a little bit less than you're going to make in the public, but at the end, you know, you put in your 25, your 30 years, and you're going to keep getting paid once you're done. And you get the health insurance. And you get the health sure. insurance for life and stuff like that. Yeah, unfortunately, because of the turnover, I don't think the pension has been a much of a recruiting tool. Uh, as of late, because uh, as Mike said, there's so much turnover there, no one's sticking around long enough to qualify. Right. Right. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. But in, in the past, that was a big selling point for all state jobs, for teachers especially. I mean, yeah, we're going to pay you a little bit less, but down the road, you're going to keep getting paid. Yeah, I think they're in the PERS system too. So there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of people had issue with the PERS system and how that's set up. Um, I don't know enough about it to, to give you a lot of information. We have more with Delegate Mike Height, who's also doubling as a co-host this morning as we roll along here on the program. We'll take our uh, 832 break here They're in the building with the uh, Delegate Mike Height and uh, Johnny the Bod, John Bodwell, too. On Friday, next, not this Friday, but next Friday, April the 7th, they'll do the Good Friday Annual Crosswalk, the last 
Seven Words, brought to you by the Berkeley County Ministerial Association. They'll gather at 10 a.m. in front of Trinity United Methodist Church at 220 West Martin and do seven stops along the way to hear last words. And at the end, they'll have a Good Friday service at the Episcopal Church at 200 West King Street. You're invited to enjoy soup and sandwiches and fellowship after. The walking pace is casual, and uh, you should wear some comfortable shoes. They tend to spend about 15 to 17 minutes at each of the stations. Judy Boykin was uh, telling me about this yesterday. We're trying to work on a date to get everybody in to uh, give that a little publicity next week as well. Major League Baseball opens up its season today, and uh, once again, they open it up without a salary cap. Uh, I was reading this early this morning, and I, you know, every other sport has a salary cap, but Major League Baseball does not. So this came across my attention this morning. The New York Mets have the biggest payroll this year in Major League Baseball at $375.3 million. The Oakland Athletics payroll is about $63 million. The difference in the two payrolls is $312.7 million. And that difference between the top payroll in Major League Baseball and the lowest is more than the combined payroll of the A's, the Orioles, and the Pirates, and the Reds. Just the gap between what the number one team in payroll spends and what the number 30 team spends is the equivalent and is in excess of the A's, Orioles, Pirates, and Reds payrolls. Well, the um, the the television money. It's the fact they don't. There's no there's no revenue sharing. I mean, they share the national money, but the local money stays with the club. And I I heard a couple of years ago the Yankees television money was equal to like the bottom twelve teams combined television money. I mean, if, if baseball is going to survive and baseball is going to thrive in all these markets, unless they want to go down to like an eight team league at some point. They're going to have to do more revenue sharing. Tony Clark, who's the head of the uh, Players Union, said there will never be a salary cap. Rob Manfred, the commissioner, said that it's the first time I've heard the commissioner talk like this. That is now something that he thinks should be talked about and considered. Well, Every yeah. other league has it. Baseball doesn't. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that has nothing to do with state business. I thought I'd Throw that out there because today is opening day for Major League Baseball. I've got a state business question that came to me from our earlier discussion. Are there other jobs in the state besides correctional officers that are having to be staffed on a regular basis by our National Guard? Are there other things that are that that far in the hole? Not that I'm aware of. And and I think that's why the, uh, the correctional officers uh, – issue is in, in crisis mode and and people are are taking a closer look at it because it is being staffed by national guards and and anytime something gets to that point that's what sort of makes people stand up and take notice and you you sort of like you're like what what what's going on here um you know did i know there was a correctional officer issue before that no not really but once the national guard's in there and and fill in positions because we don't have enough correctional officers that's when you stand up and take notice so um i don't think there's any others um like that not that i'm aware of join the guard see the world or the inside of a prison yeah yeah mm -hmm. hey so what happens as you said those 120 positions are already funded in the budget 60 are unfilled so not spending that money what happens to that money yeah as a legislator we ask that question a lot um sitting in finance you know when when a uh, a department um, comes in and, and gives their presentation um and they start talking about they need more money that's one of the first things we ask you know you have 70 unfilled positions uh at x amount of dollars and that comes out to so many millions so where's that money at um and what you see in their budget and line items a lot of time is um their spending authority how much they're allowed to spend on an annual basis and how much they have in, in cash reserves so a lot of times you'll see that money in cash reserves that it's just sitting there because Obviously, they don't have the employees to spend it on. Um, so it's not like they don't have the money or or could spend the money. Their, their attitude is, yes, we have the money to pay for the position, but you haven't given us the authority to give a raise. So we, we could spend some of that money that we have in reserves on raises, 
but going forward in the next budget, you have to give us money to to keep going with those raises because eventually that money that, that's sitting in reserves well, would run out. As John pointed out earlier, there may be a hesitancy to give a raise because it base builds, but on the other hand, a bonus does not. So if you've got 60 doing the work of 120, are they authorized, the department heads, to give a bonus of 50% of your salary? Um so the department heads i don't i don't think so i think all the things that like that they would have to come through uh, at least the governor's office or and the legislature to to be able to raise those numbers be, even if it is a bonus um one time bonus i think they would have to to get authorization to spend it that way so the year ends and you've got 50% of your payroll left over mm-hmm. unspent yeah. Well, you wouldn't because they're spend they're putting so much out in overtime. That's correct. So they have nowhere near fifty. No, well, maybe you have twenty percent of it left that, correct. that's right. unspent. Mm-hmm. Whatever, could, whatever they, the number is. I mean, if they need money, they could have a bake sale or a car wash or something. I mean, it's it's sad that our our state employees are not paid enough to stay around. Can't you imagine them out there doing a car wash in the parking lot of the ERJ? I do like chocolate chip cookies. Oh with, my, with, yeah. With the inmates washing your car. Oh yeah, sounds safe. Um, I think I'm going to go to the local softball. Um, fundraiser group fundraiser yeah. before yeah. I go there to get my car washed. Uh, so uh, ultimately, when you don't spend when you don't spend capital uh, the capital budget, you can always roll it over because you can use it on the building the next year. Sure. But when you don't spend payroll money, it's gone because you can't go back and spend it on payroll the next year. So what happens to that money? Does, does it stay within the department, or does it ultimately get returned to the general budget? Um, usually it, it takes an act of Congress, a legislature or whatever, to sweep money back in. So we, we, we sort of, we try to monitor that money, that, that, that cash money you see over in a different line item, um, to see what, you know, when it gets to a certain point, um, does it need to be swept back in? Um, or if we, if we make adjustments to pay, can they start using some of that money to to make those pays or or if we authorize bonuses or whatever um so ultimately it would be up to us to sweep it back the governor yesterday was facing a deadline on signing uh um several bills numbering in the three digits here and some of the bills he acted or didn't act on because the, the result can be the same uh included the transfer bill among students in the state of West Virginia, this is something that started off as a bill allowing private school or homeschool students to be able to participate in extracurricular activities at the nearby public school if their own school didn't offer the same activity. Uh, this later became a bill that also allowed a student to transfer one time within their four years of high school to any other district, regardless of the reason. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, the governor decided that he would not sign the bill but that meant it went into law without his signature. So that will be law this year. However, he did veto the bill which would have created uh, the SSA, which would have made the SSAC into a government entity, which would have then invited legislative oversight, Mike. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed that that did not happen because I believe the SSAC needs legislative oversight. And by legislative oversight, I mean reined in, neutered, possibly crushed, reworked, and brought back as something else Well, you can that's get, less arrogant in regards to how they conduct business in this state. Well, as long as you're willing to kiss somebody's ring, you can get everything through that you want to. You just have to genuflect, kiss a ring, and the WVSSAC will grant you an audience. So I'm disappointed in the governor for vetoing that particular bill. I, I'm not surprised. Um, he is a coach. He coaches high school sports, so he's he's um, directly affected by the WVSSAC um, in certain aspects. So um, I think this veto would probably curry some favor with WVSSAC. But he allowed the transfer and, bill to become law, well, which true. which could do more damage. If you're a coach, you could lose your best your, – your, you're losing your best player now if they want to go somewhere yeah. else anyway. They just find a class they need to take and make the excuse. But this would allow a much more easy transfer of players. You would think of the two, that would be the one that as a coach he would have vetoed. Or or maybe that allows him to recruit better now. I, I don't know. I Depends mean, on just, how you look at it, right? Yeah. Um, 
I wasn't surprised. I, I'm like you. I was disappointed. I, I think that was a, a good bill and a good start to help rein in the the WVSSAC. Um, but I'm sort of of the opinion that, like you said earlier, we just need to to disband. It needs to be that organization needs to go away. It needs to be recreated with some oversight. Um, and I don't care if it's oversight by the State Board of Education, which has no oversight, but it needs to have some oversight um, by somebody. Um, that they, they tend to make uh, rules as they go and, and uh, change their own rules uh, to suit certain situations from time to time. Um, so it, it's just it's not run very efficiently or very well at all and and probably just needs to go away are they like uh supreme court justices are they is it a position for life um yeah i don't know they're private so they can be if they want and and why why do schools in west virginia not just get pissed off and say great we're just no longer going to be a part of the wvssac well schools are, are part of the problem too i mean this 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 organization was created by the principals of the schools, so you know they still have some say in it. But it, it's gotten bigger than the schools themselves. Uh, so in some respects, they've lost control of it. I mean, I the transfer rule. I like that because there are a lot of schools that cheat, and there are a lot of schools that bend the rules to get kids to come to them. But there are a heck of a lot of schools that don't. Oh, that Jonathan, do think that doesn't happen. No. But there are a heck of a lot of schools that do things the right way and don't do that. Mm -hmm. So it sort of evens the playing field between the schools that cheat and the schools that don't. It allows anybody to move to where they want to. Well, listen, you you know, you're a kid. You've got four high school years to play a team sport or participate in any other extracurricular activity. And then it's over. That that window closes because the percentage of kids who play a college sport, much less. And it's a much different atmosphere in college than it is in high school. Sure. Uh, right. To to tell a kid that because your parents bought a home or rented a home in this zip code, and as a result, this is your situation, regardless of the competency of the coach, teacher, or counselor, that's the person leading the thing in which you have interest or skill or desire to participate in, uh, to me is unfair to the kid. You know, you you could be a very talented kid at whatever it is, and if the person at your school isn't qualified to teach it to you, have we done a disservice to that kid by making them stay in that program because of their zip code? Well, and, and I've seen plenty of cases with that. And the school systems rule that a, a teacher has precedence. If a teacher applies for a coaching job, it's going to go to the teacher versus someone on the outside. Oh, that, that happens to me every year because I'm not a teacher. I get a letter at the end of the year. It's in Frederick County that says, hey, thank you for being a volunteer paid assistant coach. Keep in mind, you can be replaced as soon as the teacher says they want your position. Right. So if, the, if there's a teacher who has no idea what they're doing, who is not going to be of help to the child, and these are teachers where they're always talking about, oh, you got to be a certified teacher, you got to be this, you got to be that, which is very important in the teaching, but in athletics and anything else, it's just as important that scum, somebody with the correct skill set is coaching, teaching, your, the students in extra, extracurricular activities, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. There are plenty of people who are coaching who have no idea what they are doing or very limited where there were other people who applied for those jobs or wanted those jobs who know the who know what they're doing and that's that is wrong that is not in the best interest of the child that is in the best interest of the teacher and of the system and I would, I would and say that's wrong that I think most people who do this and work with kids are qualified to do what they do. Some are better at it than others as in every, any profession. The numbers who are just totally incompetent at whatever they're trying to lead children into doing, I don't think is a great number. But in the kids, in the situation of the kids who are in that situation, I think it is unfair because of where their parents bought or rented a house that they'd be stuck in that situation. Well, and, and let me clarify, I wasn't saying there are a lot of them. I'm just saying there are situations. And I'm and I'm not saying that the teachers who want to be the, a coach of something or want to do an after-school thing that maybe is not their bailiwick, that 
they their heart's not in the right place that they want to be there they want to help the kids mm-hmm. they just may, may not be the most qualified person like very similar to when a school system it doesn't have enough math teachers and they have to stick a history teacher or a, a gym teacher sure. or somebody else teaching math it's the same sort of thing it's not that that person doesn't have in their heart that they want to help the kids that they want to do best just they're not the most qualified I also, person i also have some mixed emotions about uh, about this I, originally my thought was you know you're you're not there to play sports. You're there to get an education. And that's what the kids are supposed to be there for is to get an education. So I I didn't like this, you know, my kid wants to play lacrosse. So now we're going to switch schools because this school doesn't have lacrosse and that, that school does, you know, but this doesn't have to apply to sports, Mike. uh, It could be academic. Sure. But for the most case, we're not talking about academics. We're, we're, these a lot of these transfers are about sports and and the same thing with the the home schools that you know that you know i'm homeschooled and my kid can't play sports so they should be allowed to play sports on on the local team that mm-hmm. they would attend well it used to be that these sports were a representation of the school you attended so if you don't attend the school then why should you be allowed to play on that that particular but the, but the team. school represents the school district. I, I see both sides to it. And the parents are still paying taxes whether their kids are in the school or they're not. I, I see both sides. 100. To it, but, you're, 100. <laughs> but you're still supposed to be – it's supposed to be representation of the school itself. You're, you're not representing an area. You're representing the school. When you go out and play for Martinsburg High School, you're a bulldog. Well, if you don't attend the school, you're not really a bulldog, are you? So I have I have mixed them. I see both sides to it. I see that the parents are paying taxes and therefore should get the same uh, opportunities that everybody else does. But you do have the same opportunity. You can sell your send your kid to the public school. If you choose not to, then why should you get all the benefits, the other extracurricular benefits that the kids that do go? We can go so, round and round in circles on this I one for a while. There That's too. what I said. Yeah. I see both well, sides okay. of this. Well, I, I want to move on to the next bill here, John, sure. before we run out of time. House Bill 2310, which was originally an antique fleet bill. This was kind of funny because Mike Cornby was telling me about this bill from the time it was conceived. And it really morphed into a bunch of different things. It was eventually amended to change West Virginia's vehicle inspections to every two years. The governor did sign that. So now when you have to get your vehicle inspected, it'll be every two years uh, and, uh, and not annually. Uh, when I was a kid in Pennsylvania, it was every six months, which was just overburdensome and they move that to once a year in maryland your vehicle gets inspected when you buy it and then you never have another annual inspection again why don't we do the same thing in west virginia what is this state inspection thing you speak of and you know (laughs) i thought this was a good bill i didn't have any problem with this bill but i I tell you there was another bill that, that gets very little attention that i thought was much better um in the same general area and that was i think 2506 and it it provided for a clearing house title for non-resident businesses now that that may sound you know, blah blah blah, yeah, blah what does that to mean? somebody so what that means is you take a non-resident business so a business outside of the state of west virginia um and let's say it's an enterprise or a hertz or something like that and they can take their entire fleet and have it that that entire fleet registered in West Virginia, um, and a lot of these non-resident businesses want this because if there's one thing our state does right, it has something to do with the registration process. That we are leaps and bounds ahead of other states when it comes to registering vehicles um, with the ease of of how it's done. Um, so. This is something that the DMV came to the legislation about and wanted to get done. This will bring in millions and millions of dollars to the state when you have an enterprise come in and takes their entire fleet and registers it in West Virginia. So now all those all those enterprise vehicles nationwide will have West Virginia tags on them. In, instead of some other state because of the ease in which it's done. Well, they have to pay a personal property tax at each one of those vehicles. Um, I don't think they pay personal property tax. It's the registration fees alone is what we're talking about. Um, they may have to pay personal property tax on any vehicles that are stationed here in West Virginia. Um, but for the entire fleet, probably not. So you're talking about a bill that will bring millions and millions of dollars to the state. It got very little if any attention did he sign um, it 
Uh, I, I don't know if he signed it yet. I know it did pass both houses, um, so I'm hoping. He did sign the Bill 3018, establishing a floor of 16 years of age for underage marriages in West Virginia, including a provision that the marital partner may be no more than four years older. So 20-year-olds can marry 16-year-olds in West Virginia. This was a compromise on a bill where... Uh, a, a group of people, and I think Mike Hornby was involved in this, trying to get that age up to 18 because, according to Mike Hornby, there was previously no minimum age in West Virginia for marriage. So That's while mm-hmm. while I read that the first time a month ago and was horrified by the fact that the state was allowing children to get married to adults, uh, the fact of the matter is the alternative was that 12-year-olds could get married to 14-year-olds prior to this bill. Yeah, um, I voted against this bill um, when it, in its final version. Um, for that that exact reason, we had the opportunity to set the age at 18, um, which is what the House voted on. That was, it was a, a House bill. Um, it was set at 18. There was a lot of debate within the House whether it should go down to 16 because that's the age of consent. And uh, we, we came to the conclusion overwhelmingly that, no, it should stay at 18. Um, and then it went to the Senate, and the Senate screwed it up royally. And I don't have a problem saying that the Senate screwed it up. Um, to, to allow children, and 16-year-olds are children, we have allowed children to get married this was the whole purpose of this bill was to stop child marriage in the state of west virginia and what did we do no we compromised to allow children to get married in the state of west virginia i was was very disappointed in this legislation when it came back from the senate um and i don't know whose idea it was in the senate to make these changes um I don't know why they agreed to it in the Senate, um, but I was very disappointed um, and disappointed us in the House that we didn't stand up and say, no, send it back to them. We're not doing this. So wasn't happy with that bill at all. I love your stand on that. I was uh, also against the allowing 16 year old. I can't I just under no circumstances would I ever say, yes, children should get married, John. I, I agree 100 percent with you. I think it's crazy that we had a chance to move it to 18 and we didn't. I mean, I, I think I, I had my first marriage at 28. I wasn't ready. Um, 16 well, is definitely, thing. It's, it's disgusting. It should have been 18. I agree. So, And then there's another bill that comes over about an hour later. And we're getting late in the session. This is the last day or two um, that these things are happening. Uh, we had another bill that um, that dealt with making it illegal for a, a, uh, a teacher um, or anybody that works in a school system um, to have uh, sexual relationships with a student. Um, and we went back and forth with that. So, and, and originally it, it um, went into college itself. So you had a 20 year old um, college student um, couldn't have uh, sexual relations with anybody that worked in that school system. Um, which sounds good on the surface, but now you're talking about a, a 20 year old student, um, couldn't have sexual relations with, let's say a 20 year old, um, cafeteria worker which is essentially what the, the, the law would have been. And, and I was upset with that. I, you know, I, I said to a lot of people, I said, we just, an hour ago, we allowed for children to get married at 16 and now we're going to argue that two 20 year olds can't have sexual relations mm-hmm. i mean what what kind of hypocrites are we <laughs> <laughs> this is idiotic <laughs> on the face i said you know y'all have very short memories um mm-hmm. if you allow this to happen so if eventually i don't think it did i think they took out the whole um uh the the college issue out of it so that it, it stayed just in the elementary and high school so i was happy to see that so the cafeteria workers need love too <laughs> now it's that's ridiculous let 16 year olds marry but you can't let college students. Yeah. i mean that's uh-huh. ridiculous hey let's get to Asinine. our break 901 break 